I come from a server side world, so I've always done a lot of client server interaction. Um, and I got used to using Fiddler and Netmon and tools like that. And what I'm going to show you is, is hopefully going to be interesting because I see discussions around this all the time. And, and we're going to kind of prove it once and for all, that whole concept of um, referencing and duplicating your queries and how many times are we going to go out to a site to get that information. Before we get there, let me back up and talk about Fiddler just a little bit, just so you understand it. So Fiddler is a web traffic capture tool. Eric Lawrence wrote it when he was at Microsoft, um, and it was a tool that everybody kind of used, and I think it, Telerik has bought it now. If you just search for Fiddler tool, odds are you're going to find it. Um, when you start up Fiddler, it registers itself as a proxy for outgoing web traffic. So what does all that mean? Well, if you look on the right side of my screen here, um, and I'll give zoom in a shot, there we go. So <clears throat> if you see where it says Edge, i.e., of course this came from Microsoft, so that's all the browsers they're going to pretend exist. But when you use a web browser to talk to a web page, as it's, it loads a process called WinINET. WinINET handles communication back and forth uh, to the website. And so if a site has SSL, um, that means that it's going to be, the traffic that comes out is going to be encrypted uh, before it leaves your machine. And so if you were running something like Network Monitor and looking at traffic across the wire, you would not be able to see what's going on with that traffic because it would be encrypted by the SSL. So what Fiddler does is it registers, registers itself as a proxy and it makes the SSL connection with the server on the other side and then lets you see the unencrypted traffic. Um, let me go back to my view here. So <clears throat> this is a big deal. This will let us, um, that's why this tool is so popular because we could go back to tracing web calls and things like that that were going to an SSL site. Now, there are instructions on how to use it at the site, how to set it up. I'm pretty sure it's a free download. Well, I know it's a free download still. Uh, and there is actual things that you need to do as far as trusting Fiddler's private cert. Um, and that's all just kind of <laughs> jargon that I'm not going to go into, but um, there is a little bit of setup that you have to do, and, and they've got tons of prompts that pop up you know, as you're doing that. So a little more detail on that. If you actually open up your settings on your machine once you're running Fiddler, you'll actually see that it has registered itself at this address, 127.001. That's your loopback address that if you're going to talk to yourself, <laughs> that's where you go to. And that port 8888 is the listening port that it uses. It registers itself when it starts, and when you turn it off, it goes away. So you don't have to worry about changing that or not. Um, and so what I'm going to try to do here, and it's always a challenge with multiple screens, but let me just pop this up here. So I've got some stats here. I actually uh, know a kid that's playing at OU right now. I think he redshirted his first year, but uh, that's the only reason I'm picking OU. But say I want to just scrape some of the stats off these two pages. I've got a, a Power BI project set up where I'm just pulling this information in here. So let me open that up and slide that over here. And I'm going to go into my queries. And a little bit of slinging stuff around as I'm getting this ready. So these, these two are two different scripts that basically are pulling in, you know, scraping stuff from the web page and then putting it into data sets, right? So let me bring Fiddler onto the screen. Once you start Fiddler, this is the view that you have. Now, I actually have very specific filters set up so that this screen doesn't go bonkers. Um, if you do nothing else with Fiddler, it's kind of interesting to open it up and just watch all the chatter that all the various different, whether it's OneDrive, whether it's Teams, all this constant chatter that's going on from all the apps that are running. So I've got that all filtered out so you don't actually see anything here. Um, and really, the best way to show it is, let me just go ahead and 
close this. And I'm going to do a refresh. So I've got two queries. See the two things pop up there. And you can see here I've got two requests. You see this one right now says minus one. It's about to jump. Okay. So notice how that body there says minus one. That's going to change probably in a moment here. But these are my two requests. So if I click on this first line, whoa, yeah, that's Power BI likes to grab attention. Go to inspectors. So now you can see here that the body has downloaded, right? So there was kind of a delay there. When I go into inspectors here, I get this view of here's my git and here's what comes back from the other side. Again, I have SSL decryption enabled, so I can do this and actually get actual text back instead of garbage, right? So this is my GET re request to the website, and this is all the stuff that comes back, right? And that's what we're doing in Power BI. We're going in there and stripping out the data from all the HTML tags. So this is pretty cool. How useful is it? Uh, you know, you may find yourself in a situation where you're trying to look at you know, what is the request coming back? I'm getting a strange response back. What is the actual error code coming back when I'm trying to get to a website? You could use this for screen scrapes, like I'm doing now, or if you've got information stored on a SharePoint site, SharePoint list you're pulling, or an Excel document on a SharePoint site. So that's these two things here. Now, this is the point where I thought I'd try to prove this to myself. So one of the things you can do in the query editor is you can right click this query and say you know what I want to reference that query and it gives you a new script now if you come from a developer background and you're thinking about classes of objects and you're creating an instance of an object those instances of an object are reusable you can pass that object around and that means you only have to create one instance of it and you can use it over and over again that is not what's going on here. <laughs> in this case, really what we've just done when we say references, we said, okay, go get me that data again and use the steps from here, these applied steps. There is no caching or anything like that. So I'm gonna prove that to you. First, I'm gonna go out here, I'm gonna let this go. <clears throat> and you know, since it's a demo, there's gonna be a nice delay on it. Let me clear this out sheet evaluating here uh, all right so the question was always when I reference that script does that mean I just call it once and then every other time I would use that I don't have to call it again um, I kind of thought that's what was going on <laughs> and I know from a lot of comments out there other people thought that too so we're here let me go ahead and hit refresh so now we've got three queries here and if we look up here, you can see I've now got three captures. Notice this, right? This body here, this is downloading. Now, this is a small, obviously, a small chunk of data because all I'm doing is pulling some stats. But if this was a big Excel file, for instance, I've requested it twice, and it downloaded that data twice. Um, and... <clears throat> That can be kind of significant. I know I have a customer that I'm pulling Excel files from SharePoint, and every time I reference or something, it's got to pull that file again. So you deal with all the issues of connecting with SharePoint over and over again. Um, the other piece I wanted to discuss just real quick, if I duplicate, so let me come here and duplicate. Duplicate now basically says, hey, create that script again but actually have the steps here as well when I reference it there is a connection to this in other words if I make changes here it's going to flow through to this one so you think about this script has all of these applied steps plus whatever else I add here whereas when I duplicate the script uh, it's kind of its own independent script and I have all these steps here but again, I'm going to have four queries now. And so if I let this go and delete this out and I hit refresh again, you can see I've got four queries here. Interesting, too, that 
when it says evaluating, a lot of times it's actually still pulling the data, but there we go. So now here's my two requests here, and here's my two requests here. Um, so yeah, that was kind of interesting to me. I always thought when you reference or duplicate that it, it didn't do that. Just a little bit more on Fiddler, like if you really need to get down into the details, like I said, you've got here's your get request and you can literally, literally see the content that comes back. I just use, typically I use inspectors and I use this raw setting here, so I'm just getting raw HTML back. Um, this tool has a ton of features, way more than I ever use. Um, and you can do things like clear the buffer every time and clear cache, et cetera, et cetera. It actually, I think it will, let's see here. I think it has some, um, yeah, it's got some inherent support if you're passing JSON data back and forth or XML, it'll parse some of that for you. So really, really cool tool. I did want to point out uh, just to head off the question uh, and I see a question. I'm using Chrome, by the way, for my browser, but um, that doesn't that doesn't the browser type shouldn't matter. Um, I actually the, one of the other things I see out there all the time. Boy, isn't that a big confusing mess? <laughs> That's what it looks like when you're scraping web content. So a lot of times in the news groups, I've seen people talk about, well, you should use table.buffer because what that'll do is it'll buffer it in memory so you don't have to keep going back and getting it. That's not the way table buffer works. And the reason I could say that is I've had that turned on this whole time and you still see those multiple requests to go out and get that content. Table buffer has to do a lot with, from my understanding, whether it's gonna stream the data to Power BI and kind of interact with it as it's streaming or if it loads it up once and, and then you deal with it. I, it's not the not something I understand too well, but I can tell you this, it does not affect the amount of times you're going out and pulling data as you're going through your queries. So, you know, as Eric said, this is not the built-in capabilities um, as far as query diagnostics, but it's just another tool that you can think about using if you're trying to analyze why it takes so long to load your project, right? I think everybody, if you, once you get to a certain size project in Power BI Desktop, really it can be slow. And so this kind of can help you understand, well, I'm downloading a five meg file over and over and over again, or a 10 meg file or something like that. So uh, that's pretty much all I got there. Any questions on that? If you got them, go ahead and throw them in the uh, question box there. Yeah, Dan, so uh, we had one question. Um, it says, is Fiddler retrieving the data without having to use the browser? Yeah, okay. Um, let me pull my, my diagram back here. So the browser itself, you can do it a couple different ways. So you can just launch Fiddler, and then you can click a button, and Fiddler will launch its own browser. Um, but what it's doing in this case is it's registering itself in WinINet. So Power BI Desktop, it's a great question. Power BI Desktop has to talk to the internet, has to talk to web servers. So it's using WinINet as well. Uh, basically, when Fiddler opens, it sets itself as a proxy. So that means that any web tool that you have, any tool that's talking to the web, pulling data from the web, is going to go through Fiddler before it goes out. And so... <laughs> one of the things that will happen, and it happened a couple times while I was sitting here waiting for the meeting, is you'll have this running and you'll get weird certificate errors pop up and everything because, you know, you're hitting weird sites or OneDrive is getting confused or something. So it's a good question. Don't need the browser open. You can open a browser, like if you're trying to duplicate steps or see what's going on when you're browsing a site, but um, it's actually doing it through WinINet. So it shouldn't be browser specific. Uh, next, next question: um, Does Fiddler need any special security permissions? Yeah, absolutely. You're going to have to be uh, at least. I think it's a. You got to be an admin on the desktop because if I have a moment here, let me go show you that section. So I went to Tools Options and then I went to HTTPS, and this is where you turn on telling it to actually decrypt SSL traffic. And when you turn this on, you're going to get a series of pop-ups, and it's going to try to register Fiddler as a 
I'm trying to remember the term. I think it's like as a master certificate authority or something like that. In other words, there's only a few that browsers really trust. Microsoft, uh, VeriSign, all that kind of stuff. There's a very specific trust built in as to who can issue SSL certificates and who can't. And when you turn this on, you're telling it to trust Fiddler, uh, which everybody uses, right? So that's why you have all these pops that come up about, hey, you need to trust the certificate, but then turn this off afterwards and don't leave it running, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not a security guy, but uh, that's that's how I know it. And you know, just come in here and turn it off afterwards. Yeah, it's not going to give me the pop up right now, but good question.